Well, I go to Omaha for a few days and the stock market starts to unravel. Go figure. Of course, the reason behind today's big move lower and yesterday's move lower as well is this continued strife between the United States and China in terms of the so-called trade war that's starting to develop. It's possible that by the end of this week, the United States will impose an additional $200 billion worth of tariffs on Chinese imported goods. And so uh, the stock market is sitting up and paying attention. Uh, it's causing a little bit of headaches. Uh, stocks are selling off as a result. All 11 sectors were lower today. We actually still have a bullish intermediate posture on the S&P 500, but we did flip to a bearish posture on the Dow Jones. And so a lot of different things going on. Uh, I did want to focus on one bearish trade idea from a sector that struggled for the last couple of months in our application. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's May 7th, 2019. First of all, welcome aboard. If you're new, go to our YouTube channel, click subscribe. Also sign up for our email distribution list, which you can find in the description area on YouTube. We're also heavy users of Twitter. Uh, hopefully some of you were following my posts over the weekend when I was back at the Berkshire Hathaway event. I uh, had a fun meeting uh, Becky Quick from CNBC, uh, kind of rubbing shoulders with some other fun investing uh, personalities out there, uh, Mario Gabelli and Monish Pabrai, also some tech titans, uh, Bill Gates and uh, Tim Cook of Apple showed up as well. So a lot of uh, hoopla there in Omaha. Uh, if you wanted to check out some of the things that I experienced, check out my feed. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. And then lastly, we have a presence on Facebook as well. Uh, you can see the web address embedded in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the data. As you can see, I've got a little bit of a different view here towards what we normally look at when I do these market outlook presentations. Just wanted to give you guys a sense of the breadth of today's move. Today was not a normal move. Uh, we've been kind of uh, co coerced into this sleepy condition and assuming that stocks just always go up forever. And of course, the reality of the situation is that is not true. Uh, it never has been, never will be. Uh, today uh, is a, a, a big pullback, but it won't be the last time we go down 1.6%. So uh, get used to the feeling uh, if you want to be hanging around the, the markets for a while. But this does give you a sense of things. What I've got pulled up here is the Market Watch tab on the Thinkorswim platform. I've gone to the Visualize area and then I pulled up the S&P 500 public watch list here to give you a sense of how many stocks were up and how many stocks were down in the S&P 500. Now remember there's a, a couple extra ones beyond 500 stocks because some of them have multiple classes like, like Google has uh, multiple classes and uh, a number of those uh, media names do as well as uh, stocks like Under Armour. But nonetheless, it gives you a good sense of how you know a broad basket of stocks performed on any given day. And you can see here, there were only 36 stocks in the S&P 500 that finished higher today. 470 of them finished lower. Uh, that was a pretty dramatic move in the stock market. You can see there were a handful of stocks that were up. This is one of the bigger ones. In fact, I think this was the stock that was up the most this morning when I posted the nine at nine. This is AIG. AIG was up about six or 7%. But otherwise, you can see a lot of red bars here and you can start scrolling lower and there'll be more and more of those red bars as well. Uh, and so again, very ugly day, strong uh, negative performance across the board. It wasn't just a, a, a big beat down for the uh, mega cap stocks or anything like that. Uh, it was consistent across the board of the S&P 500. Uh, another thing to, to take a look at, I'm gonna come over here to the quotes tab and just give you a quick sense of how ugly things were within the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So we just got looked at the uh, the S&P 500 a moment ago, but uh, the Dow Jones didn't fare any better. In fact, uh, you could even say it was worse. Now, granted, there's only 30 stocks in the S&P 500, whereas there's you know over 500 in the S&P 500. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a clean sweep for the bears here today in the Dow Jones. You'll notice right here, there was not one single stock that finished higher in the Dow Jones. 30 for 30 to the downside uh, with, with losses here today. The best performer was Chevron. It was only down 0.11%, so it almost got back up above break even. Uh, but on the negative side of the equation, you saw Dow DuPont down over 4%. Boeing was almost down 4%. And remember, Boeing is going to be one of the most impactful stocks uh, in the Dow due to its larger size than all the rest of these stocks that are in the index. So uh, things were not only ugly in the S&P 500, they were also ugly over there uh, in the Dow Jones. 
Also, I wanted to show you this quick chart here. Don't look at this chart too often, but uh, today is a day where it might make sense to do so. This is chart 4K for those of you that are premium market scholars following along at home with your own charting package. Kind of like to look at this chart when we have above average days because it kind of gives us a sense of what's going on in terms of um, you know, unusual type of activity. Now, when you look at this bar down here in the red, I'm kind of circling it with my mouse right there. Notice that it has come down and closed below that blue bar. So that black uh, line in the middle is kind of the zero line. And then the blue line on the, on the lower end of it would be 1% down. The blue line above the black line would be 1% up. Uh, the orange line down below would be 2% down and the orange line up above would be 2% up. So you can see that today, today was an outsized day. It didn't just feel like it to some of you. If you looked at your portfolio and saw a, a lot of losses there, uh, it, it wasn't just you. Uh, it, it was across the board. Uh, you can see that this is the first time that we closed lower uh, than 1% down since going back to this candle back here. That would have been on March 22nd. Now remember, at one point in the day, it was even worse. We were actually threatening uh, going down 2% here today, but we actually had a decent rally at the end of the day. If you look at that candle up there, uh, that that is today's candle, you'll notice that we do have a long lower shadow. It's not tremendously long, but there, there is some separation in the tail of that candle underneath kind of that box part or the body of the candle itself. So it does remind us that we did not close on the lows. Remember on that candle back here, we actually did close on the lows of the day. So uh, it was kind of an unfair advantage. Had we closed on the lows of the day here, we would have been uh, just as ugly of a candle as we saw back here. And uh, prior to that, uh, we would have had to go all the way back here to the beginning of the year, early January, January 3rd, before we saw any day like that. So uh, today was a big day. Now, having said that, keep in mind, this is still an uptrending chart. Uh, it is possible that seasonal conditions catch up with us. You know, we've been uh, reminding you of that not only in May, but leading up to May of the whole chorus of sell in May and go away. There will be people that subscribe to that theory. Uh, and if they do, they will have to recognize that they will be wrong on occasion uh, and right on occasion, just like any other type of uh, strategy that you might implement. But it is true that if you go back over history, uh, all of the gains of the stock market average averaged out uh, come from the months of November through April. And then basically the months of May through October produce zero gains. Um, now, of course, that's averaged out through history and any one random calendar year like 2019, it's anybody's guess. What we do know right now is that the path of least resistance continues to be to the upside. Uh, we do have uh, you know, more stocks hitting new highs, as an example, than new lows. So there's not extreme you know, conditions existing here that would suggest that we're about to roll over in a big way. But going back to what I mentioned in the intro, we also have to recognize that no matter how many different you know, signals we can look at from a technical analysis perspective or even a fundamental analysis perspective, if there is a trade war, all bets are off. <laughs> so um, you know, while the economy is strong, unemployment uh, rates are quite low, uh, and, uh, and, and corporate profits are coming in, uh, firing in all cylinders in many cases, um, you know, that's, the, that's the past. And, and the future is unknowable. Uh, we try to look at some of these uh, conditions and these uh, statistics and data points to try to kind of frame our mind about certain assumptions about the future. But we also have to recognize guessing the future perfectly is never going to be possible. Right now, what we know is that we're starting to feel some stress in the marketplace. And I would anticipate that if indeed the U.S. goes forward with this idea of pushing through $200 billion worth of additional tariffs uh, on China, that I would expect that the stock market will not like that. Uh, and we may have to give back sizable chunks of uh, the gains that we've made already this year. But remember, that's at least a, a, a sign of strength. You know, it could be worse. Uh, we could have, uh, you know, maintained the low levels that we were at at the end of last year and just been going sideways. And had we get gotten hit with this news right now, we'd be breaching new lower lows at this point. So, you know, if there's one, you know, kind of calming element to the market, it's that we've received probably undo types of gains to the upside. So if we do have to give back some of those gains, it won't hurt quite as bad as in other types of situations. Let's get back on track with the normal flow of things now. I'm gonna go back over to chart 4B 
And this will be our market forecast for grid here, where we can look at all four of the charts side by side by side and see if we can see any sort of uh, differences uh, in, in setups and different things like that. As a reminder, these are the four equity indices in the United States. Each one of the charts is three months in length. And the background color of the chart will tell you whether the intermediate posture on the market forecast is, um, is bullish or bearish at this moment in time. And so like I mentioned in the intro, there is something to report, something new to identify and, and make sure that you're aware of. And that is the Dow Jones did go to a bearish posture today. So, you know, while this has happened pretty quickly and, and just really most recently out of four out of the last five days, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the intermediate posture can't change as a result. So things were looking pretty good about a week ago, but now we're starting to see deterioration of the candle. And so we have to recognize that, you know, we don't know if this is going to lead to, you know, further destruction in, in price action or not. Uh, what, what we need to do is make sure that we see when there is stress in the charts that we recognize that and perhaps, um, you know, adjust accordingly, you know, and, 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 and like we've mentioned before, that doesn't necessarily mean, okay, we're starting to see all this selling. We have to go from a 100% long portfolio to a 100% short portfolio, right? Uh, we don't make knee jerk reactions like that. Uh, we want to kind of leg into positions in and out of the market. And in this particular case, you might do something like um, reduce your position sizing if you're concerned about what could happen with, with trade uh, or, or different things like that. So uh, right now, it is worth noting the Dow Jones did finally go to a bearish posture. Remember, it's been a long time since that occurred. It's, it's way back here uh, in late March when that was last the case. Um, right now, we're barely hanging on to a bullish posture on the S&P 500, but it is darn close. Notice where that green line is right now. Remember, that green line is the intermediate line, and that's what we use to set the posture. Uh, and so it's at 80.22 and falling. Remember, you can read that right in this label right here if you have access to chart 4B as a premium member of Market Scholars. So when that green line falls below 80, which again, we're very close, 80.22 and falling. So in other words, if there's another uh, down day tomorrow, there's a very good chance that starting tomorrow, there will be a bearish posture on the S&P 500 as well. On the other hand, if you know some, some news comes out overnight and they resolve their issues in China and the United States uh, are off to uh, high-fiving each other again, uh, you know, we might get a, a big move out of the market higher. And if that's the case, it might be saved by the bell. But right now, given the fact that we've gone on a pretty strong move in this most recent intermediate run to the upside, it, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect this exhale that's taking place in the market right now. And it doesn't have to mean it's the end of this bullish move that we've seen for the last 10 years, right? Uh, every move uh, that we see along the way um, is going to have pullbacks, right? We, we've never seen a stock market just go straight up every single day. So this could be very much part of the normal occurrence of the stock market. It just feels uncomfortable um, because of the, the, the trade news. But remember, every pullback feels uncomfortable for whatever particular reason happens to be affecting market psychology at that time. So you do your best to try to, 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 to stay calm in situations like this, recognize you know uh, where there might be opportunities, uh, and then also recognizing where we've come from. And the fact that we have to give back a little bit of the gains is not the end of the world at the same time. Now, one thing I, will, I did want to point out here, so with the, you know, the, the down moves, we had 1.65% to the downside for the S&P 500, 1.79% to the downside for the Dow Jones, 1.96% to the downside for the NASDAQ composite, and then the Russell 2000 was down just over 2% today. However, the Russell 2000 is kind of interesting in that it is still above that rising moving average. You know, it's kind of been interesting to watch the Russell 2000 because it didn't go up as much as the other indices earlier in the year. And therefore, maybe it's just um, a delayed reaction. Hard to say. We'll, we'll find out soon enough. But what I, what I would say is that as of this exact moment in time, it almost seems like the Russell 2000 would be an interesting place uh, to put a bullish trade on for those that are so inclined. And the reason for that is we've got a little bit more separation between where it's trading right now and that rising 30-day moving average. Whereas you look up here, the Dow Jones has clearly breached the moving average. The S&P 500 has breached the moving average. And you're basically sitting exactly on top of the moving average with the NASDAQ. And so uh, in a strange way, this is the one that's kind of setting up for very, very close to what would be known as a bullish 
intermediate confirmation signal. It's not quite there, but it's very, very close. And the reason I say it's not quite there is if you look at the momentum line down below here, it's at 20.85 and falling. So remember, if that line were at 20 or less on the close today, that would have been considered a bullish intermediate confirmation signal. So um, anyway, if we do get a little bit of a pop, you know, let's say China and, and the United States resolve their issues, uh, then this is one where you could actually say it's got a little bit of recent relative strength, even though uh, over over several months it might not have the relative strength. Recently, in just the last, you know, let's call it week or, or so, you do have a little bit more stubbornness, it seems, out of the Russell 2000, where it's not willing to give back huge swaths of, uh, you know, the last few weeks. You know, again, you look at the Dow Jones and you look at where we closed, you'd have to go all the way back to this candle over here on March 29th, as far as where we are now trading. You know, and whereas if you look at the Russell 2000, heck, it was just three days ago you were trading at these levels. And so, you know, you, you just haven't given back as much in terms of time and price with the Russell 2000 quite yet. So for those of you that are trying to hunt down bullish trade opportunities, uh, like to see that that recent relative strength, then perhaps the Russell 2000 could be an interesting place to look for that. Let's look at the uh, next chart setup. This will be the three green arrows chart setup now. Uh, something to report new here as well. And that's why we look at these charts on a, on a regular basis because they don't always stay the same. That's the nature of markets moving around all the time. Uh, and we do have something to report here. Three out of our four charts went to three red arrows as of today. Notice that the S&P 500 got a red arrow on the moving average, as did the Dow Jones, as did the NASDAQ composite. All three of those charts already had red arrows on the MACD and the stochastics. And so by closing below the 30 day moving averages, we effectively have three red arrows on three out of our four major indices here in the United States. Now the Russell 2000 doesn't have three red arrows yet because it remains trading above that rising moving average. We also have a green arrow that's still in place on the MACD, but we did get a, a phantom red arrow kicking into place on the Russell 2000 uh, for the stochastics. So again, a little bit more strength being, with, uh, being held within the Russell 2000 right now. Not only uh, is it still trading above that rising moving average, uh, which I alluded to on the last set of, of graphs, but we also still have that MACD that's positive. Right, uh, these other uh, charts are not showing that. We we have red arrows on the other charts. So one more sign that in this immediate moment in time, the Russell 2000 has just a little bit more strength uh, than those other uh, three charts that we we like to look at here. Let's look at the 1040 crossover method now. Nothing big to report here because remember this is not a very sensitive approach to trading. Uh, this is uh, a longer term approach where we're looking at weekly candles and we're going back three years in length and we're waiting for the moving averages, not just the price uh, to cross uh, the moving average, but the, the moving averages themselves to cross. So it's a real slow moving uh, type of way to look at markets. It's not right for all of you. Many of you are probably quite active with your, your trades. But for those of you that are uh, maybe uh, you know conducting trades within your 401k where you don't have as much opportunity uh, to trade you know every single day, maybe you can only trade those mutual funds in your 401k you know once a week or once a month or what have you, then this could be a way for you to kind of slow things down, eliminate some of the noise of the day-to-day -day volatility and look at things from a, a week to week perspective. And as it stands right now, uh, we don't have any negative crossovers to report. However, I will point out that the Dow Jones did get this little red arrow up here. And remember, that's not the, the important aspect of, these, uh, of this 1040 crossover method. It's more of a sign of stress. So when you see that, basically what it means is that price now closed below this orange line on the chart. And that orange line is a 10-week moving average. So while we don't actually call this a negative condition yet because the orange line itself would have to come down and close below the blue line. That'll take a few weeks uh, at a minimum to, to uh, happen if it happens at all. But in order for that to happen, then price has to start trading below those moving averages. And so those little red arrows aren't really part of the official condition that we look at uh, on this particular chart setup, which is 4D, uh, but it's just a quick heads up uh, that, hey, there's stress out there. Uh, and we are now starting to see that stress manifest itself through price uh, closing below a 10 week moving average on the Dow Jones. We don't see that yet on the other ones, but we're awfully close. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you in the loop on that if that does develop down the road. Let's now go ahead and take our look at our uh, 
12 grid. Actually, before we go to the 12 grid, uh, let me just take a, a quick a quick uh, a break in these charts to show you that we do have some stocks reporting earnings after hours. Uh, and so I know EA reported earnings. This is Electronic Arts. Uh, that stock closed at 92.73. It is going up nicely after hours here. You can see that we're up about $5 per share on Electronic Arts after hours as we've zoomed higher on their earnings announcement. So that, you know, hopefully uh, is a good sign. On the other hand, uh, we also had TripAdvisor come out after hours, and that thing is down pretty significantly. It closed at $54.94. It's currently trading at the last traded price was $51.50. So it's down about you know three bucks or something along those lines. Of course, these uh, are not uh, ingrained. Uh, they're not set in stone uh, would be a better way to phrase that. There can be plenty of movements before the opening bell tomorrow morning, but it can at least give you some early insight as far as you know things to expect out of these specific companies. And perhaps if you're the owner or if you're shorting uh, some of their competitors in your own portfolio to kind of get some insight as to how the, the market might lump in your stocks uh, with these types of companies as well. And then there was another one, Lyft came out as well. Now remember, this would be Lyft's uh, first uh, report as a publicly traded company as one of the more recent IPOs. And keep in mind the importance here because Uber is actually going to be reporting or doing their IPO later this week unless things really start spiraling out of control. Uh, remember, they uh, they can cite market conditions for being a reason for pulling the IPO. I doubt that would happen uh, with a, with a, with an IPO this important, but it has happened plenty of times in the past. Remember that the companies that choose to go public want to sell their merchandise at the highest possible prices. And if the stock market starts falling apart, some of those companies have decided to pull their IPO because they know they're not going to be able to fetch as high of prices. Uh, so uh, that's why it's always a, a little bit more of a risk to uh, be dabbling with some of those IPOs, unless, of course, you're beyond meat. Uh, that stock uh, just defying the odds. Uh, beyond meat up another 5% today, for those of you that didn't catch it. So that stock has just been a home run. But anyway, back to Lyft. Uh, Lyft did report their earnings here tonight after the bell. And you will see that they're trading down just a little bit. Now, remember, there was some intense implied volatility for this name. It was over 100% implied volatility on the uh, on the contracts that expired this week. Those would be the ones that would be most prone to some sort of massive move higher or lower based off of the earnings that's reported today. And so the, the market was anticipated a major, major move. In fact, the market was expecting a move of about 5 dollars and 68 cents you can kind of see that mmm move listed right up there five dollars 68 cents so what's actually happening is a more mundane uh one dollar per share move lower at this point again that can change by tomorrow's open but nonetheless this stock did trade at 59.34 at market close it's currently trading at about 58 dollars and 38 cents so um, for those of you that might have uh, sold strangles or straddles or other things on Lyft as an earnings play, you're probably thanking yourself on the uh, or thanking your stars on that. On the other hand, for those of you that might have bought straddles or strangles, you're probably a little bit disappointed in this whimper of a move that you're seeing out of Lyft so far. Uh, also, uh, a quick uh, moment to mention that if you guys get value out of these uh, videos, be sure to click like on uh, Twitter or on Facebook. Obviously, if you don't have uh, any sort of social media accounts, you don't need to do that. But if you do and you want to support us, we would certainly appreciate that. Uh, obviously, uh, David and I are running a very small business and uh, we don't have a massive uh, marketing budget. And so uh, the way that we get the word out about our services is through social media. If you want to participate, fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. But I do want to say thank you to those 97 of you uh, that clicked like last Last time around uh, and also for those of you that uh, gave us a thumbs up on uh, Facebook also as I see over here on our, our popular recent posts a, a quick heads up to those of you that are already premium members of market scholars I did put together a position size calculator uh, for my strategy lab swing trading class and I did post that uh, to our blog area on uh, I think it would have been maybe Thursday night or Friday morning. Uh, and so feel free to check that out. If it doesn't come up automatically with the recent post here, you can go up to blog and then remember to go off to the right hand side with the categories drop down and choose resources. That's where you're gonna find all of our important resources and shared scripts and charting setups and tutorials and you know uh, sector watch lists and, and all that kind of stuff. All right, uh, also, 
I taught a class today on dividend growth investing. We looked at the industrial space. Uh, and so for those of you that want to check that out, that recording is now available on our calendar. Uh, David taught his uh, directional option strategies class uh, today as well, talking about some of the trades he's been making lately. And then uh, tomorrow we've got options inventory trading coming up for David's class at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And then my strategy lab class will be at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And for those of you that want to you know, hear my experience about my weekend in Omaha, uh, I'll probably do that Thursday during my question and answer session. All right, back on track on to uh, the paper money account. Let's go ahead and take a look at some 12 grid analysis here briefly. Uh, on the intermarket analysis 12 grid, I did want to point out that the VIX has really made a massive move. Right? And for those of you that trade options, that's a very important consideration uh, because as the VIX goes higher, options become more expensive to buy, uh, but also uh, maybe more uh, interesting to sell premium on as well. That's been a common complaint about this market that seems to have inched its way higher day after day for months on end here recently is that volatility was eking lower and lower levels where it didn't make a lot of sense to be you know selling premium in some cases so you can see that the vix exploded higher here today we were up 25 percent on the vix and we did close just a hair below 20 uh and that would have been the first close above 20 uh since going back to, to last year so uh anyway or at least in the last three months you can see where we closed here on the chart it was higher than any of these candles on the board right here in the last three months uh so we were up uh 25 percent on the vix today and closed at 19.32 uh on the other hand of the, the, uh, the spectrum here, you can see that uh, the 10-year Treasury yield fell today. Uh, remember when the stock market starts getting a little bit queasy like it was today, typically you will find that yields will fall and bonds will go up as a result. It's kind of more the safety play. Uh, Treasury bonds were in play today. Notice that TLT started to make a nice move higher here today, uh, up 0.77%. Uh, and so that is normal market reaction right there. Uh, the, the Treasury, uh, the 10-year Treasury yield is now at 2.44%. Seems like a long time ago since we were, uh, you know, tapping uh, on that uh, that three percent level that everybody got you know so worked up about at that time uh, and so uh, markets have uh, kind of gone a different direction uh, than what a lot of people assume to be a foregone conclusion that interest rates were going to start going up from ultra to low levels and and that just has not played itself out at this point uh, other things to be aware of junk bonds did fall today that was probably a, a result of you know, risk drifting away from the riskier end of fixed income and into the safer end of it, uh, fixed income with government bonds. Also, it was a recognition that crude oil prices were lower today, uh, down 1.3%. Remember, crude oil uh, had been one of the stars of the market in 2019, but for the last four days, we've been trading below that moving average, and that's something that it has not uh, been, been used to. Uh, and so that's kind of an interesting occurrence there and uh, could cause additional stress for, for risk-seeking markets as well. Uh, we did find that gold was a, was another safe haven type of an asset today. Gold was up 0.15% today, and I think uh, even GDX, which is the gold miners, let me just check it, but I'm pretty sure it was up as well. Yeah, GDX was actually up 2.02%. Now, it had been getting beat up, so don't get me wrong. This is just getting back a little bit of the gains, but or, or the losses, I should say. Uh, but it did have oversold cluster signals here within the last week or so, and now we're bouncing off of those levels. And so if you do expect additional chaos uh, beyond what we saw here the first couple of days this week, a lot of times market participants will start drifting towards GLD to, to buy gold all by itself or GDX to buy gold mining securities. And so keep your eye on those if you think we're, we're heading for some chaotic times in the marketplace. You'll also see that REITs had a, a pretty nasty day down about 1.8% to the downside closing uh, you know, below that moving average yet again. Let's take a look at our next set of 12 grids here. This will be our foreign stock markets 12 grids. And as we look at this, uh, there's only one green chart on the board, and that's Germany. Uh, that would actually be an interesting choice for those of you that are uh, willing to be a little bit more bold and take some bullish trades. Uh, I think you know Germany's chart has been pretty stubborn to the upside. 
Now, it is true that a lot of these other charts look pretty ugly. And, you know, if you're looking at international markets, it is possible that Germany just gets lumped in with all the rest of them. And you just start seeing selling across the board. It is also possible that uh, the U.S. dollar could be viewed as a safe haven asset. And if that uh, happens, then, of course, foreign stocks are going to struggle, uh, generally speaking, as well. But uh, for those of you that want to go a little bit counter uh, trend, uh, then perhaps uh, Germany is, is going to float your boat right there. It's an interesting place where we still have a, a bullish posture and it's sitting right on its rising 30-day moving average right now. And you can see it had a, a very consistent set of uh, higher highs and higher lows along the way. But otherwise, there's a, there's a lot of ugliness out there. Worth noting today with all of the hullabaloo around the trade talks, uh, China, and, and we're using FXI up here. There's a lot of different Chinese ETFs, but this is one of them you can use to kind of gauge uh, you know, the, the general sentiment around China. And you can see it was down 2.7% today. So again, remember that the United States was down about 1.65% today. So China has suffered uh, more as a result of this news that we've seen in the last 48 hours. Uh, so just be aware of that. We're actually at probably two and a half month lows on China right now. Not quite three month lows, but getting very, very close to those levels. So just be aware things are, are starting to really unwind in a hurry with Chinese stocks. And then back over here to the United States, there's been a lot more stress in the US as well. Uh, the only uh, area that's showing green on a sector perspective is the financials. Of course, S&P does, but the financials specifically are holding up reasonably well. And I had noticed that in recent weeks with my sector selector uh, tool as well, we've started to see a little bit more strength out of those financials. But if interest rates do stop, uh, continue to fall, um, it, it has you wondering whether the, the financials will be able uh, to maintain this strength here uh, or not. Right now, the trend is with them. Uh, but if that macro condition exists and we start seeing plunging interest rates, I'd have to believe that the financials will eventually uh, start falling as a result of that as well. Otherwise, uh, we got pink charts across the board on all the rest of the securities, including the healthcare area, which remember last Thursday, I think it was, is when uh, I did that bearish trade on XLV specifically. Today, I do want to focus on that sector yet again, but I want to go into an individual stock within that sector. So for that, let me come on over here take a look at chart 4A, and we'll pull up one of the biggest components within XLV, which is MRK, and of course that's Merck. Now, as you can see, uh, Merck was actually one of the stronger charts out there for, for several months. You can see some nice, consistent upward trending action over here on the left-hand side of the chart, and then we really fell out of bed here on Merck uh, in April, and that was at a time when you know there was a lot more stress on healthcare companies and you know how the politicians were targeting them, and you know perhaps going to force them to lower their drug prices and this, that, and the other thing. Well, eventually we got to a point where four out of five days we had oversold cluster signals right there, right there, right there, and right there. Uh, and that kind of formed that bottom right there where we did have a reversion to the mean type of a move. And that's fairly typical. Uh, you know, remember that you, you typically will find, you know, that the downward price action will start uh, resolving itself either by snapping back higher or by going sideways after you get a lot of these different um, bullish clusters or oversold clusters, however you want to state that. Uh, it was actually five in a row. My, my apologies. This one's being hidden because there's a, the little label right there. But you can also see down below, it'll show you those little green dots if you're using this chart 4A. So five days in a row, you actually had oversold cluster signals on Merck. We had this nice snapback rally, but notice where it went to. Went right up to that downward trending 30-day moving average. And now for the last couple of days, it started to roll over again. In fact, rolled over enough where we went from a bullish posture to a bearish posture as of today. Notice that green line started the slump over right there. So from an intermediate perspective, the posture went back to bearish right now. And so uh, with this price action, if you believe that we are destined to go lower at this point and kind of start carving out some of those lows near where we bounced last time, then perhaps doing a bearish trade right here could make some sense in Merck. So here's what I had in mind for this one. Uh, I've got it loaded up here already. As you can see, I'm using the June monthly contracts with 45 days left until expiration. And I'm doing a long put spread. Now, this is a more directional type of a trade. Some of you might choose to do uh, a short 
short call spread, that would also be bearish and could be an acceptable choice here. Uh, for those of you that wanna be a little bit more aggressive uh, and get a little bit more re rewards as a result, then doing a long put spread, which is also a, a, a bear, bearish trade, uh, could be useful for you. Um, so it kind of depends on how aggressive you want to be. If you don't want to be aggressive and you think it's just going to kind of top out around here, then selling the call spread could make some more sense. If you think that things are going to really spiral out of control for the entire stock market, then by doing a long put spread like this, you have greater reward possibilities. So you can see that this is going to cost me $2.20 out of pocket to put this trade on. But if I were to come over here to the confirm and send and click that once, you'll notice that my max profit is $280. So my max loss is only 220, my max profit is 280. So it's a better than one for one reward risk possibility here. And so uh, for those of you that want to have that possibility for a little bit more exciting returns, then perhaps this one will get you done. Now, it does require the stock to move, right? In order to get these gains, we need that stock to come down and close below 75 on expiration day in 45 days. And there are no guarantees in this business. And so, um, you know, if, if China and United States come together on, on trade policy and the market gets back to, you know, um, puppy dogs and rainbows, as they say, uh, then it, it is entirely possible that the stock market goes right back up. Uh, and if that's the case, then this stock will, or this trade will probably lose. On the other hand, if, if we do start seeing more gas down uh, taking place in the market, then this one could be one that is setting up for an interesting bearish trade. So I'll go ahead and send that one off and we'll see if we can get filled first thing in the morning. All right, well, I wanna thank you for joining me here today. Always a pleasure to go to work for you again. Dicey times in the stock market and unless we get some resolution in this whole trade policy, uh, you better brace yourself. It's entirely possible we have more of these choppy types of sessions going forward. The good news is we didn't close on the lows of the day. The bad news is the Dow Jones has now gone to a bearish posture. So uh, a lot of things to be aware of here as we go forward. David will be back with you tomorrow. I wanna wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.